So uh, you're launching through the wrap. You're launching your your first annual short films festival. Tell me what inspired this uh, this decision. Um, well, you know, we're always trying new things at the wrap, and that's the really fun part about having built um, a platform uh, for movie and television, you know, enthusiasts and insiders. And part of it was a desire to see if we could use the platforms we have to promote um, the best of film in general. And so we're starting with shorts, and I'm hoping that we can do well with a shorts festival and have a lot of participation and then grow it into a feature-like festival. And part of that also is kind of a feeling that there needs to be new approaches to film festivals in general. You know, it's it's kind of the discussion that, um, I've had with friends in the industry. I've gone to festivals for many years, and some festivals are still absolutely critical uh, and really uh, lively, dynamic parts of film culture. But, uh, you know, as you know, technology is changing everything, and we want to find other ways to use technology to get these films that are only seen by a small group of people out to a bigger group of people. And you know, we pick shorts for a couple reasons. One is it's where I think where young people, young talented people, that's the format they're using overwhelmingly. Um, and there's not a lot of places to see shorts. You know, I mean, you're not going to just sit around and watch one short after another online. Most of us aren't going to do that. So we wanted to spend some time and energy and effort finding the very, very best short films of the past year and bring it to our audience and saying, hey, you know, you can watch this in a really short period of time and it's really entertaining and smart and it may touch you or it may make you angry or it may, you know, it affect you in all the ways that great filmmaking can. Mm-hmm. And and your the festival is very unique in, in, in several ways, one of which is, it, as you just expressed, it really, these shorts really are the best of the best. Uh, tell me about the selection process. How did you narrow these picks down? So um, we invited submissions from uh, winners of short festivals from all over the world, uh, and we got, uh, I don't know, you know we, in other words, for, for, on the one hand, you know, we had to be realistic about what our resources were, right? So, for example, just for, for contrast sake, YouTube, I believe, is running a short film festival, and they had 15,000 submissions. We absolutely don't have the resources as a <laughs> uh, as a website or as a news operation that's starting different kinds of uh, events and stuff like that to, to process and watch and really properly weigh and judge 15,000 films. So... We thought, and by the way, you know, I'll be curious to see what the quality of those films are. You know, that's that's a lot of submissions to go through. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we went out and solicited submissions from all the top film festivals. We got a lot of, I was surprised at how many submissions we got. And we had uh, programmers who watched them and recommended uh, recommended the finalists. And had a, we had a debate about it, and um, that's how we chose the finalists. And there are 12 finalists, correct? There are 12, there's 12 films. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Mm-hmm. And, they're, and from, another... they're from film festivals that they're from, they really are from all over the world, funny enough. Um, and they're winners of South by Southwest and the winner of Sundance and winners of Venice, a, a winner of Venice. And the, the films are from, you know, there's Brazil, there's um, Italy, there's, um, you know, many of them from the United States, but they, they really do come from all over, from all over. Yeah, and and another aspect that makes this festival really special is the fact that there's an audience award included in the in the program, and and online uh, users can visit the website and vote for their favorites, right? Exactly, that's right. So you can go and see um, all of the twelve films are up on uh, shortlistfilmfestival.com, and you can just go through the twelve of them. You can you can watch it them anytime. You can vote. You only get to vote once. <laughs> And uh, we already have actually thousands of votes. The festival's only been up for two days, and we already have uh, thousands of people who have voted on the, on the film. Mm. So we're also we're highlighting a film a day, and MTV, who's our partner on this, is also uh, highlighting a different film a day for their audience, and they're going to be interviewing filmmakers and that kind of thing. Oh wow, 
That's great. So so our listeners can visit shortlistfilmfestival.com. They can view uh-huh. the films and, uh, from now until the 4th of September, and they can Correct. vote for their vote for their favorites. So at, at the end of is there a ceremony at the end of this where these awards are presented? Yes, there is. So we're having um, an awards uh, ceremony on the 4th. We're going to be showing the top three vote getters in each category um, for the in the audience category and in the jury category um, at a screening on the Sony lot. And we're going to have the jury's going to have a we're going to have a discussion about how you break into the film business and about the state of independent film. Our jury are all very. Um, well uh respected and veteran members of the indie film community so the the idea is also we want to help people learn how, and especially these filmmakers help them break into the industry and hopefully find representation even if they don't find distribution for this particular piece of work but that they will find you know connections in the industry and that's who we'll be inviting to this event and then we'll be giving out awards the awards no, that's great because I mean to to actually be singled out as an award winner award winner in one of these festivals is is great, but then to offer kind of the guidance and the and the education to succeed and take it to the next level is also very important. So I'm I'm glad that's included. Yeah, well, I think that's really critical too. I mean, you know, the it because so many of the old ways of doing things have gone away. Um, you know, film festivals often do serve as a way to surface and to look at new voices in filmmaking. Um, but it becomes very, there's so many festivals now, you know, and yeah. people scrambling all the time. So this is, I mean, it's just a different way to have a similar experience and to bring those t- filmmakers together with the, the, the business side of the community so that they can find their way. Yeah, and and also, I mean, beyond being an, uh, uh, winning the actual award and 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 getting guidance from all these great panelists, which you do have great panelists in, in the, on the jury, um, uh, they they also have uh, they also win a sixty thousand dollar camera package. Yes, that's right. Panavision has uh, is is uh, awarding a sixty thousand dollar camera equipment package to the winner. Um, both winners will be aired on MTV, and there's a, a couple of other things that we still haven't announced that will be among the prizes. Oh, wow. That's awesome. <laughs> Exposure <laughs> on thing. MTV and a camera package and, and a great jury that views your films. That's that's incredible opportunity right there. Um, well, I, do, you, do you mind if I ask you two quick uh, other questions? Sure, go ahead. Uh, I, I just wanted to tell you, I read your piece on um, – on Tony Scott, but I think you posted it yesterday, and it, I thought it was was very beautifully written. Uh, and I, I just I just wanted to express that to you because it's it, for all fans of his, it's just a completely kind of mystifying circumstance. And I think you expressed a tremendous kind of respect for that that feeling. Wow, well, thank you. It, it, it's such a shocking thing, you know, what that Tony Scott would choose to. Um, do what he did, you know, it's just it's extremely shocking to everybody and he's one of those people who's been around for so long is, you know, if he if if he's not somebody who people knew directly, then people knew of him or would see knew he was when they saw him. It's not it, you know, it's a pretty small and tight knit community in the film world and he was one of those guys who didn't just work, you know, in an isolated way. He had he made tons of commercials and he produced, you know, dozens of projects. So it just it, it touched so many people directly, um, and that he would, you know, suddenly be gone. I mean, I think Paula Wagner, um, the producer. Uh, I mean, the, she's a producer, but she was Tom Cruise's agent when uh, Tony Scott made Top Gun and Days of Thunder with Tom Cruise. But she knew him really well. And she expressed it really eloquently. She just said, you know, he's just kind of been ripped from us. And, you know, he was this incredibly, it was, he was a life force. And he felt that life force in his movies, the kinds of movies he made. It, you just, you're just kind of stuck with a bewildering feeling of, like, how could that be? Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. He was, I mean, every time I saw anything from him, uh, interviews and such, I mean, he did seem like such a, 
vivacious guy that was full of life. And we were talking about his influence the other night on the show, and he he was really a major player in defining the modern action movie. I mean, the, the entire yeah. style of the action we see nowadays. Yeah. Absolutely true. Absolutely yeah. true. And I also want to ask you about a, a, a book that you recently came out with. And for those that are that just follow the rap and just know you from the entertainment angle, this might be surprising for them. You, you wrote a book on the the antiquity business. Uh, I did, yeah, called Luke. <laughs> yeah, it's about uh, it, it is about the uh, the looting of antiquities from countries uh, from the countries of origin, and so how those countries have de- been demanding their stuff back from museums, mm. from great, from the great museums. And it sort of goes into the history of how the great museums of the world were built. Uh, they have this sort of, you know, dirty, dirty laundry in their history because so much of their early collections, the, the Egyptian collections, and I'm talking about the Louvre and, and the, the British Museum and the Met I mean, and, and the Getty here in Los Angeles where I live, uh, these are the great museums of the world, and they really were built uh, in, a, in a really significant way on looted antiquities. Yeah, and I think it kind of involves a, a moral question too, doesn't it? Well, not I wouldn't say just one. I mean, I think it, it raises the question as to where antiquities belong and do yeah. and. Are museums the proper custodians of those things? And also, you know, whether, to me, fundamentally, there there's a, a really interesting debate to be had as to where antiquities belong. Because sometimes when antiquities go back to their source countries or those antiquities that are still in their source countries, they're not, they're, they're free, I wouldn't say frequently, they, frequently enough, they're not t- well taken care of. And they are destroyed just because some of these countries don't have the means to take care of them. Or there's a, a, a looting, uh, you know, culture, so they stuff gets dug out of the ground. But at the same time, that does not absolve the responsibility of museums to um, to recognize the history of of looting. And I feel, at the very least, you know, to tell visitors about where this stuff came from, not and the circumstances in which they got to museums. What I mean, where they came from, I don't just mean you know, Mesopotamia circa, you know, uh, 2000 B.C., I mean, saying it was dug up in this circumstance, and if it was looted, to say so. I mean, it, many, many mm-hmm. pieces that were just ripped, literally ripped it, in some cases, blasted with TNT from from existing monuments or out of the ground to be taken as trophies to uh, museums during, largely during the age of colonialism, but not always. I mean, up to yeah. modern times, too. Well, you actually—I mean, you're 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 a fantastic journalist, but also, uh, if I read this correctly, you received your master's in Middle Eastern studies. Yeah, that's a crazy little detail, but true. <laughs> so, so did you? I guess you called upon aspects of those studies when you put together this book. I would imagine, right? Yeah, yeah, but I really had to learn so much more than I already knew because. As, as you said, it's modern Middle Eastern studies, and a lot of what I was doing, uh, well, everything I was doing was ancient, although it does involve the age of colonialism as well. And then th- there's a whole Greek and Roman civilization, which I had never studied. So I, I, it was a, it was like getting another degree, actually. It was really fascinating. 